I want to begin by saying it's my distinct pleasure to be here with you this evening while all the world marvels at an NFL football game. It is my distinct pleasure to stand before you and while that is all fine and dandy, but we are here to ascribe worship to that which is true and right and worthy of praise. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 146. The title of this sermon is An Ode to God's Trustworthiness. That's Psalm 146. Let me begin with a statement. Where your trust lies, there your hope and security lie also. Therefore, the recipient of your trust better be a reliable recipient. Whether it's a someone or something, it better be reliable for your hope and security lie there. It's the general case of the affluent to trust in their wealth, the executive to trust in his or her career, the popular to trust in the approval of others, the intelligent to trust in their GPA, the athletic to trust in their accolades, the alcoholic to trust in a substance for refuge from reality, the young to trust in their beauty, strength, and charm, the elderly in their wisdom and lived experience, the lofty to trust in their authority, and the lowly to trust in their leaders. And all the aforementioned possessions, personal attributes, and relationships can be of some benefit if stewarded well but they prove to be catastrophically detrimental to us when valued too highly or clung to too tightly. The scriptures are clear. First Timothy 617, do not set your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies for us all things to enjoy. Or Proverbs 3130, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh shall be praised. Maybe Proverbs 3, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. When these things become the source from which you draw reassurance, everything, the, the, the reassurance that says everything is going as planned, everything is okay, you've lost your way. If that's where your reassurance is in wealth and in beauty and youth and intelligence and in people, you've lost your way. So if we can't reliably trust in any of those items or identifiers, then the question must be asked, what can we trust in? Or better yet, who can we trust in? Well, that's exactly the question that Psalm 146 answers. The psalmist discloses three acknowledgments that depict the all-surpassing trustworthiness of God's nature and God's character. Look with me to Psalm 146. He begins, Praise Yah. Praise Yahweh, O my soul. I will praise Yahweh throughout my life. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not trust in nobles, in merely a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that very day, his plans perish. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in Yahweh, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who does justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Yahweh sets the prisoners free. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. Yahweh rises up those who are bowed down. Yahweh loves the righteous. Yahweh keeps the sojourner. 
He helps up the orphan and the widow, but he bends the way of the wicked. Yahweh will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, from generation to generation, praise Yah. The first of our three acknowledgments received from the psalmist is the priority of praise. In verses 1 and 2, the psalmist begins, praise Yah. He openly declares and announces God's greatness at the outset of this psalm. He doesn't wait for supportive testimonies, anecdotes, and reasons to praise God. He praises him simply for being God, for being one who transcends all other things. God's existence and name are evidence enough to elicit praise from the psalmist. And so it should be said about you. The first line, he says, praise Yah, a call and an invitation to all of creation to praise God. And then he says, praise Yahweh, oh, my soul. It's a self-exhortation. As if I were to look in the mirror at myself and say, Andre, you know better. Andre, you know what you must do. He is saying, Yahweh is worthy of praise. Woe is myself if I do not praise him in a deserving fashion. The name Yahweh used there. Our God has many names, but the name Yahweh here with specificity is brought, is brought to bear on the text. He says uh, the name Yahweh is first used in Exodus 3. Uh, When God says to Moses, I am who I am. And in the Hebrew, it is expressing his state of perpetual being. God just is. He is an immutable fact. There's no way around him. Nothing exists apart from him. And nothing has a sustained existence apart from him. This name is a declaration of the unchanging and eternal self-existence and the perpetual testimony to his faithfulness, to his promises and his people. So in its usage, it conveys that God is ever present with his people to deliver, redeem, bless, and keep covenant with them. Not only does he praise God, though, in the present, verse 2 says, I will praise Yahweh throughout my life. He vows to praise God for the duration of his life. It's an expression of commitment, of deep resolve, of forecasting into the future that because God is unchanging, my praise of him will be unchanging. He says, I will sing praises to my God. This is the very essence of praise, is it not? Praise is an external expression of an inward enjoyment. C.S. Lewis says in his reflections on the Psalms, delight is incomplete until it is expressed. And not only does he say he will sing praises, but he says he'll do it while he has his being. He recognizes his finitude and the frailty of human life. That life is fleeting and opportunities to magnify God's name in this life will soon be gone. John Piper says nothing purges man of his folly like thinking of death. And that calls to mind Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. The wise man is well aware that his death date is fast approaching. Brief are our days here, friends. Brief, but a vapor. And this is an appropriate transition as he invokes the frailty of human life to his next acknowledgement. It is with that very wisdom granted by Psalm 90 that our days must be numbered. 
And that is a sobering wisdom to approach all of life with. That he brings us to verse 3 and 4, where we must acknowledge the pain of trusting people. The pain of trusting people. And there's three primary reasons that he invokes here uh, for the reasons to recognize and acknowledge the pain that is trusting in people. And those reasons are the absence of deliverance, the futility of the flesh, and the perishing of man's plans. He says in verse 3, do not trust in nobles or princes. He doesn't refer to the average man or the lowly. But to grab our attention, he says, even the greatest among you are not worthy of your ultimate trust. Those whom the world would esteem, a prince, a politician, an athlete, an actress, they're not worthy of your ultimate trust. The place from which you derive hope and security. Because they too will fail you. He says in the latter portion of verse 3, in merely a son of man, a son of man, as in contrast to the son of man, who has the ability to redeem humanity. And that is exactly why he says, do not trust in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. There is no deliverance. Any promise of redemption or, or, or revival of the soul from another human being or from that which is a cr of created existence here on earth, your occupation, things that are temporary that we know will not enter into the next life with us, they're not worthy of our trust. They're not reliable. And all of this is pushing to a head for us to understand that God is the one who is faithful. God is the one who is reliable. In by saying there is no salvation in the son of man. It's testifying to us of our very need of salvation at all. How many men recognize that they need a savior? Very few. How many men recognize that it's not that they're a bad person, but they're desperately wicked. And standing in the courtroom of God, God would not be just if he allowed their wickedness to enter into his presence for all of eternity. God must punish sin. For he is upright and he is just, as we will see in the remainder of this song. And what do we need saving from? Yes, we need to be saved from our enemies. David speaks of this in Psalm 59. We must be saved from this body of death. Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death in Romans 7? We must be saved from this world system and from the the faulty leaders on earth. Galatians 1.4 testifies to this. But ultimately, we must be saved from sin and its appropriate consequences of death. He goes on in verse 4 and says, His spirit departs, speaking of man, even this prince, even this one of great nobility, his spirit departs. He returns to the earth. Speaking of the futility of human flesh, it is but a vapor. We are here for a moment and then we are gone. Know this, as the sun rises and the sun sets, so too will your sun set. The flower of the flower withers and the flower fades, and so too will you. The esteemed English poet John Dryden from the 17th century says, all, human, all humane things are subject to decay, and when fate summons, even monarchs must obey. 
Death is a sure thing for all of us. And I want to be clear, as the psalmist is driving it, showing us the frailty of human beings and their inability to satisfy us and their unreliability because they are dependent on a source outside of themselves for life, for direction, for wisdom. This section is not calling us to become embittered and emblazoned with rage towards people because they are less trustworthy than God. Notice there is no rebuke here issued to the prince or the noble in this section for failing to be trustworthy. The council is focused on the direction of the truster, not the trusted. It is your duty to wisely select who you place your trust in. That is on you and I. Yes, each of us should do our very best as we strive to imitate Christ and we embrace the means of grace that he has given us to be trustworthy as best we can. But human beings will fail you. My wife and I, we love one another. But if I set my intentions to believe that my greatest satisfaction will be found in her, there will be moments of disappointment, even in the slightest infraction. Uh, we can speak of things so trivial as telling one another we'll be home at 630 because we had plans for the evening and 730 comes and someone arrives home. You've now set yourself up because you've placed your trust in a place where it does not belong for your ultimate hope. You set yourself up to be saddened. So this section here is telling us and teaching us and calling us to see the frailties of even the most trustworthy men and women and to realize they are directed and sustained by a source outside themselves and that we are wholly dependent on the mercy of one who is far greater than we are. But it isn't so with the self-sustaining God. He is one who is truly trustworthy. And as we've looked at the priority of praise and how we need to humbly submit ourselves and find that we need to extol and exalt God's name externally, the bubbling joy that we should feel as we understand the life that God has brought us into in his son Jesus Christ should give way to external expression. Thus we see our priority of praise and having seen the futility of mankind, their absence of the ability to deliver, the, the futility of their flesh and the perishing of their plants. The psalmist now turns in the direction for us to see the glorious and the perfect promise keeper who is none other than Yahweh. Verses 5 through 9, I'll read once more. And just catch the rhythm here. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in Yahweh his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. The argument continues to build. Who keeps truth forever? who does justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Yahweh sets the prisoners free. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. Yahweh raises up those who are bowed down. Yahweh loves the righteous. Yahweh keeps and sustains the sojourners. He helps up the orphan and the widow. But he bends the way of the wicked. At the outset of this all important section, we see a bountiful blessing. And if we look at the literary scheme of this entire song, look at verse one, praises are issued to God. Look at verse 10, 
praises are issued to God. And then we see in verses 3 and 4 that mankind is not worthy of our ultimate and highest trust. And then we see in verses 5 to 9 that God is worthy of our ultimate trust. And verse 5 right there in the center is the apex of this entire passage. How blessed, or quite literally in the Hebrew, how happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob? How happy is the life of the one who trusts in this one, who has rightly determined that of true value and rightly determined that of true worthlessness and has gone after that which is truly beautiful, lovely, and valuable and has completely forsaken that which is worthless. Verse 5, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob. And friends, if we remember the story of Jacob, some commentators literally refer to him as God's rascal. For his character is not what we are to model. But there's something to be learned from the story of Jacob and his relationship to God. Jacob deceived his brother Esau to steal his birthright. And the means that he used were ill-gotten. They were wrong. But Jacob recognized that which was truly valuable. Whereas his brother Esau forsook that which was truly valuable for a hot meal, for that which could temporarily satisfy. He traded eternal refuge for temporal comfort. And that is seen in Genesis 27. But in Genesis 32, something very peculiar and interesting happens. Jacob wrestles with God. And there's many different perspectives on what this truly intends to communicate. But one thing to glean from this passage is that Jacob is one who strived with God. He persisted with God. He clung to God. He recognized that God, once again, was what is truly valuable, truly beautiful, worthy of our highest estimation. So may we not be spiritually nearsighted like Esau, but in contrast, as the psalmist invokes here, so that we may be blessed. May we truly treasure God. From the next line, he says, whose hope is in Yahweh, his God, invoking a personal relationship. Is he truly your God? Only a fool would say God does not exist. But even among those who recognize the deity and the divinity of a being who is supreme over all things, Do they recognize his relational desire? Do they recognize that he has chosen mankind as his crown jewel of creation? That he has bestowed responsibility upon to go forth and image his glory on all of the earth? To be fruitful and to multiply and to create representatives of his glory throughout all of the earth. And while that was a physical multiplication in the Old Testament, we know in the New Testament that Jesus in his great commission has instructed us to spiritually multiply, to go forth and make disciples. Have you recognized this God, this covenant-keeping God, the God of Jacob, as your God also? And the reason that the psalmist can confidently say, blessed is the man whose help comes 
from this God and whose hope is in this God is seen right here in verses 6 and 7. And this is the beginning of what I call God's bank of credibility in this psalm. Verse 6 says, This God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, referring to God's creative power and his desire to show and display the beauty that is derived from his wisdom. God spoke and said, let there be light. And with an immediacy and an exactitude, what he said came to pass. No human being has power like this. No occupation holds authority like this. No political office or C-suite executive holds this kind of wisdom. God is worthy of our trust. For one who is this powerful can truly lend a hand and help. He is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. And seeing that he is capable and reliable to help, we see that he is also the one to whom we should look to for our greatest hope. He says he keeps truth forever. He keeps truth forever. 1 John 1.5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The Christian's hope is in the unstained one, the perfectly righteous, the pure and immutably unchanging one. Not only was there light in him, but there forever will be only light in him. There is no darkness in him at all. We have no anxiety when we come to God. When we trust in God, because we're not considering what he may or may not do as we do with mankind. As we do with relationships and occupations. When we consider all of the variables that go into us achieving our dreams that we've set forth for ourselves in our own hearts that are subject to change. We can take refuge and be anchored and comforted and situated with a smile on our face, knowing that God will not change. God So we've seen God's creative power, God's fidelity to the truth. And then there are five more testimonies here. God helps the oppressed and the needy. We see this in verse seven. It says, God, who does justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, Yahweh sets the prisoners free. Think of Israel. Think of the Exodus. Those who are oppressed by the wicked. God truly sees them in their pain and he sets them free. The wickedness of Pharaoh and those who trusted in him were brought to shame. They were swallowed up in their sin. While those who trusted in Yahweh were liberated and guided and directed to the land of promise. He also gives food to the hungry on their way to the land of the promise. Think of the fresh manna that he provided the Israelites. God is a provider 
He sees your need and he meets it. That's not speaking to every want in your heart. But he sees what you truly need and he provides it. And may we be like the psalmist and praise him in such circumstances. We see next that God heals the afflicted. Look at verse 8. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. In John 9, Jesus literally heals the man who was born blind. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul announces that God has opened the spiritual eyes of men. For God who spoke and said, let there be light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Psalm 34, 5 says, Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Their faces are radiant because they behold the sight giver with the sight that he has given. In the same way that Jacob clung to God, even though he had already stolen the birthright, he knew that that birthright needed to be conferred to him by God, the one with true authority. So he begged God for that birthright. God is the giver of all things that are truly precious. Our money can buy us things that are temporal. Relationships can comfort us for a moment. But God is lasting. A simple word, lasting, but one that carries so much weight. This very water bottle will be drunk and gone at some point. But Jesus is the true well that never runs dry. God is lasting. So God heals the afflicted. He gives sight to the blind. He raises up those who are bowed down, makes the lame walk. Yahweh loves the righteous. And he upholds them. Verse 8 tells us that God loves the righteous. In former times, it was those who believed God and took him at his word and purpose to uphold his law, like Abraham, when it tells us, when the scriptures tell us that Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. Now, as those who have the privilege of looking back, we recognize that it is those who have received the perfect righteousness of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Those who truly look to God, recognizing their own sinful nature, that we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice. Those who look to God for deliverance, for salvation, he upholds them. What comfort we can take in Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a work in us will bring it to completion. What comfort can we take in Philippians 2, 13, that it is God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God upholds the righteous. Those who look to him will never be ashamed. Yahweh keeps the sojourners in verse 9. This makes us think of the story of Ruth. Naomi, leaving her land in a time of famine and cruel leadership under the age of the judges and sojourning in a land far away from home. 
experiencing great suffering, losing her sons, losing her husband. But this entire story is representative of God's faithfulness in that Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, journeys home with her, that God sustained them in a time that seemed desperate, brought them home, redeemed them. And through such redemption, we see now, from that line, the Savior was born. God supports the vulnerable, and God upholds the the sojourner. He helps up the orphan and the widow. Each of these verbs here in this anthology of God's credibility through redemptive history are seen in the participial form, meaning that they're not only present, but that this is an ongoing, continual action. So it's not that God did justice for the oppressed, but God truly does justice for the oppressed forever. It is his character. He can do no other. For for him to look away would be for him to stop being God. God didn't just provide for the Israelites, but he gives food to the hungry always. For man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. He has given us true and lasting nourishment, nourishment that is of true value. But it is incumbent on us, as those who have been set free, to make the proper estimation to recognize, once again, that God's word is that which is of true value and true worth. Yahweh sets the prisoners free. He will continually free those who come to him from the oppression of sin. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. The gospel message, as it continues to go out, will continue to redeem. Yahweh raises up those who are bowed down. Yahweh loves the righteous. That is a steadfast, ongoing eternal covenant-keeping love. It is an incomparable, unrivaled, inviolable love. Yahweh keeps or upholds the sojourners. As we walk in this destitute land, This land that has many amenities, but lacking in very, lacking very much so in that which is of true worth. God is promising to keep us. God is promising to sustain us. God is promising to walk with us and continue to conform us to the image of his beloved son. At the very end here, in our recognition of God upholding the righteous, excuse me, we see in verse 9, at the, at the very end of verse 9, that God brings to ruin the way of the wicked. There's an abrupt change. This is the only contrast made in the entire passage. The only word but that is mentioned in this entire passage. They continue to build on God's trustworthiness so that we should rejoice and praise him. But a stern warning lies here at the end. But he bends the way of the wicked. 
We know from, par- from Proverbs 3, 6, that if we acknowledge God in all our ways, he will make straight our paths. Well, with that same trustworthiness and with that same faithfulness to his promises, you must take him at his word when he says he bends the way of the wicked. And who are the wicked? Many times in our modern age, it is so easy to look to the grievous, sexually immoral, to look to the fringes of radical political movements and call on them as those who are wicked, which is true. The scriptures are clear. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the homosexual, the adulterer, the fornicator, the the pornographer alike all have no share in the kingdom. But neither does the thief, a drunkard, a gossiper, a slanderer, or a swindler. Whether Whether you sin with your hands, your eyes, your mouth, your nose, your ears, it is the heart that is wicked. The heart that places its trust and seeks its supreme satisfaction in something other than God is the wicked heart. With that mentioned, I would like to say this. If you're not a Christian or you know those who are not Christians, and you have conversations with them in this coming week pertaining to the trustworthiness of God. To you who may be here or to them, to whoever has not bent the knee to Christ or received him in their heart as Savior, I entreat you not to place your ultimate hope and trust in whatever payoff comes from Maintaining a good image in this world. But I implore you to place your definitive and unwavering and unsurpassable trust. Your unsurpassable reliance. In God. For he is exceedingly more faithful. Than that which and that which he promises to those who trust him is abundantly more fulfilling than anything that can be found in this world. For this world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And to the Christian, the one who has recognized that they cannot place their trust in anyone other than God and that which he graciously provides. To the one who, along with the psalmist, can say, I've made these very acknowledgments, the priority of God's praise, the pains of trusting people, and that God is the perfect promise keeper. The psalmist concludes this text with an epilogue just for you. He leaves you with the words of profound comfort. Verse 10, Yahweh will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, from generation to generation, praise Yah. Yahweh will reign forever. Those words alone ought to give off an aroma that smells sweeter to you than the bloom of cherry blossoms in springtime. He will reign forever. His kingdom is without ceasing. Both now and forever, God's sovereign rule is unrivaled and will never be thwarted. For that, he is trustworthy. Your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. He is not just God, but once again, he is your God. He is yours and you are his. You are not just a spectator of his goodness, but in Jesus Christ, you have become a recipient of his covenant love. And his glorious grace. And he concludes in the same manner that he started. Praise Yah. 
calling all people, all of creation, to praise the Lord, the one who is seated on high, the name above all names, the one whom we can truly identify as reliable, valuable, beautiful, lovely, kind, and trustworthy. God is worthy to be praised. His track record of trustworthiness leaves no option other than to praise him, for he is incomparable in every respect. The psalmist has extolled and exalted God. And now I appeal to you to see him as the preeminent recipient of your trust. Will you do that? I hope you will. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we can trust in you. In a world where there is so few options for us to truly trust in, to find hope and security in, we can look to you who has revealed himself not only in creation, not only in his word, but in his son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that every person under the sound of my voice right now would be empowered and upheld and kept by your sustaining grace. And that you would put your linchpin in our trust so that it would be an unbreakable bond that we hold with you this day and forevermore. We ask these things in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm-hmm.